This is Duke University. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started just so we can get the conversation going. Uh, welcome everyone to our latest Tell Me More event. Uh, we're really excited to have Dr. Celeste Rolfing here uh, to speak with us and hear more about her career in science, research, policy, et cetera, et cetera. So many things. Um, so I am Christina Plant. I am a, a assistant director of career services in the Career Center and I lead the science and sustainability community. And a little bit about this program, it was designed to almost do a deep dive into learning about uh, different career paths, um, seeing what different education and training is required for certain fields, looking at different responsibilities and work settings that, that could um, be in, in a certain area, industry trends, resources. So hopefully we can, we can really get into, um, into the, uh, the details here today. Um, there are some undergrads, graduate students uh, joining us in the audience. Um, and a little bit about uh, the agenda, we're gonna do the first 45 minutes more of a discussion between our wonderful student volunteer, Anna and Dr. Rolfing. And then for the last 15 minutes, we're gonna do um, more Q&A. So hold on to your questions. Um, we can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself uh, at the end. So happy to continue the conversation there. So I'll just do some, some um, introductions. So we'll start with Anna. Uh, she is a senior at Duke, finishing out her chemistry degree. Um, if throughout her four years, she's focused on research concerning the development of materials for sustainable energy applications. Um, and she's also had a summer internship at NYU and the Institute of Science and Technology in Austria. So she's gonna be returning to Austria for a year long research internship studying nanomaterials and then hopes to travel and, and keep reflecting on kind of her career in next steps. Uh, and then uh, for Dr. Rolfing, um, she received her undergraduate degree in chemistry from Duke and a PhD in chemistry at Princeton University, um, spent her research career at Los Alamos and Sandia National Laboratories. Um, moving to the, to the National Science Foundation, she served in several executive positions, concluding her federal career as a deputy assistant director overseeing the world's leading research portfolio for the physical sciences and mathematics. And she also served as the assistant director for physical sciences in the Obama administration in the science and technology policy area. So her last position before retiring was chief operating officer at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So at this point, I'm gonna kick it over to Anna to, to get us started and um, we'll, we'll conclude or begin the, uh, the discussion portion. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to continuing the conversation. I find your career trajectory um, really fascinating and very impressive. Um, but going back to your time at Duke, um, can you just tell me a little bit about your, your time at Duke and, and how you ended up um, studying chemistry? Of course, and uh, let me just first say, Thanks very much, Christina and Hannah, for doing this. I'm really happy to be here and excited to answer questions uh, when the time comes. So, and I'm also really excited to be here during the week before the final four. Uh, always, always a blue devil. So, uh, sure, I had in high school, I had a encouraging biology teacher and a terrible chemistry teacher. <laughs> and uh, when I matriculated at Duke, I was actually just 16. And I know Christina is going to show this picture which is uh, the Duke Freshman Directory, which was published every year. And I'm gonna pull that up and I'm down there in the corner. Yes, <laughs> you can see that. So um, anyway, when I filled that out, you see, I wanted to be a research biologist. I knew kind of what I wanted to do. At Duke, I had really inspiring chemistry professors and not so inspiring biology and physics professors. So, so for me, the decision to major in chemistry was really an easy one. Um, I like to think of it that I have a lifelong interest in science. And so for me, it was just really choosing like the length scale of science. Biology was a lot bigger and physics was a lot smaller and chemistry seemed just right. And chemistry was also a field where you could create something that 
never existed before. Um, and times have changed. So biology is becoming that field now because of you know, CRISPR-Cas9 technology. But that's how I, I became a chemist. Great. And um, after you finished your four years at Duke, you decided to pursue a PhD. Um, can you tell me about your decision to do that? Well, I wanted to keep learning more. I was very thirsty for knowledge. <laughs> and so by my junior year, uh, between my coursework and other things I was doing, I really focused in on the intersection of physical chemistry and mathematics and, and uh, quantum theory and computer coding, all that was like a research area that really interested me the most. And so it was really cool. It allowed me to predict physical and chemical properties prior to ever even doing experiments. And that just really interested me. Uh, so I did not really think about a job or a career path that would follow after getting my PhD. Um, no one in my family had a PhD. I just assumed that I would be employable and uh, make a good salary after four more years of education. Awesome. And do you have any advice for um, students about attending graduate school and, and what they should weigh in considering if graduate school is the right move for them? Well, I think graduate school, uh, I found out, was a real adjustment. Um, it's it's almost like starting college. It's not quite as big a leap because you're more mature, more independent, but there is this experience of uprooting oneself, settling somewhere else where you don't know anyone and starting over you know, in another part of the country. And I remember that being a, a surprising uh, aspect of the transition for me. Um, for, for, for people going to graduate school or considering that, I think the decision should include some time, some self-reflection again, on your thirst for knowledge. And you have to balance that against something I call deferred gratification, because you're not going to be earning a real salary like your college classmates for, for some years. So balance that. And you know there are more folks without a PhD in science than with one. So there are really all kinds of job prospects for you if you decide not to pursue a PhD. Yeah, do you, um, could you say more about the opportunities that are available out there um, in science without a PhD? Well, I think if you want to stay in science, then you know the options are things like a, a laboratory technician, um, because you know again as a chemist you have the chemical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the biotechnology industry. There are places to go and continue to do science, but there are actually a lot of other options. I think if you have a bachelor's degree in science, I mean you could become a salesperson like for any of those industries that I mentioned, because having that technical knowledge will really give you. Uh, an upside to being a salesperson. And of course, there are people who just want to teach and you can be a teacher with that. And uh, I used to say science writer, but I guess I would say science communicator now. There's a real need for people who can communicate with the general public about science. So those are some things I would, I would think about uh, with an undergraduate science degree. Awesome. So after you finished your PhD in chemistry, you moved on to working in um, the Department of Energy and the National Labs. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your day-to-day -day life, life as a researcher at Sandia National Laboratory and kind of how that changed as you gained more research experience over the years. Well, um, for those, I know there are people on the, uh, listening in who are graduate students, I would say that actually life at the National Lab wasn't a lot different than being a graduate student, other than you know you aren't doing the coursework and you aren't teaching, um, but you do have you know committee work and other special assignments that do take up time. You do have the freedom to uh, pursue your own ideas and not just those of your advisors. Um, I certainly got to travel more to conferences and uh, could more frequently present my own research. Uh, I think. What I really enjoyed was getting to engage in collaborations with scientists uh, at both at, at universities, industry, and at other federal labs around the US and, and some internationally. Um, and not just scientists in my specific subdiscipline in chemistry. I have a lot of collaborators who are material scientists, engineers, and physicists. Um, you asked about when I had more seniority. Um, I don't think my day-to-day -day life really changed over the years, other than I started hosting, visiting scientists and students and postdocs who worked with me from time to time, but I did not choose to pursue a management track at Sandia. That would, that would mean giving up science. I see. Um, so in your opinion, how is the research at the National Labs different from the research done in industry or academia? 
Well, I can't really answer for industrial settings other than that the research areas are, are almost certainly driven by what a, what a company needs to improve its products or to create new ones. Uh, the research in academia can be really similar to that done at a national lab. But in academia, there's a, there's a pressure to bring in grant money and establish an independent reputation uh, as an individual scientist and, and to train students. At a national lab, collaboration, I feel, is really prioritized over more so than individual achievement. Um, and also found the resources in terms of like a lab space or specialized equipment are, are just far better and sometimes really unique equipment that you can't get access to in academia. Cool. And can you tell me a little bit about your transition from working in the national labs as a researcher to working in leadership positions in the NSF? Why did you decide to kind of make that career switch? <laughs> well, uh, I wanted to take my sort of lifelong interest in science in a new direction. I had been a researcher for 12 or so years, I believe, at Sandia, and I was publishing and doing new things and working with people, and it was all fine, but there was a sameness to it. So science is a, is a lot more than just pushing the frontiers of knowledge. Um, so I had grown to appreciate a more the important place that science has among human endeavors and its role as a driver for the economy. And I'm going to stop there because I warn people that the train may come by and guess what? Here comes the train, let me mute. <laughs> Okay, really sorry about that. <laughs> I live in downtown Durham and the train just goes right on by when it wants to. So uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, I was thinking about the, the place of science and, and it's, its bigger role in the economy, in, in medicine, just the quality of life. And there were big challenges facing our nation then as there are now. Um, and I thought I wanted to move away from individual scientific discipline research into something that was that had a bigger impact. And this was 20 years ago when I went about so when I made that change. So see, I can relate to that desire for having a bigger impact. Mm -hmm. um, so what was that like, like taking on those various uh, leadership and scientific management roles at the NSF? What, what's the day to day of that like? Mm, OK, well, uh, let me just say that I think that the what was exciting about NSF is we were, again, this was 20 years ago and there's been a lot of progress since then, but there was a beginning of this breakdown of the individual silos of individual scientific disciplines and much more cross collaborative work, which is something I had done a lot of as a researcher at Sandia. And I was really excited about being involved in trying to uh, make that happen by using the sort of the instrument of federal funding. And so there's been a lot of progress since then. Um, Day to day, I mean, there's, you know, you start off doing grant proposal reviews and talking with a lot of really interesting and talented people, you know, coming from academia, industry, national labs to work at a place like NSF. A lot of time spent on uh, building ideas, you know, where should the science be going? We don't want to be too heavy handed at NSF and directing where it should go, but we also know that there are again, national problems that need attention and we want to create opportunities there. I would also add that one of the things that I really found fulfilling at NSF was it has a very uh, strong respect for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I got to spend a lot of time working in those areas as well. And that was particularly fulfilling. Yeah, so in terms of your goals for things like diversity, equity, and, um, and inclusion, um, were you able to like kind of make an impact like you wanted to and, and achieve certain aspects of those goals and kind of see that in the world? Um, most definitely while I was working in the chemistry division at NSF where I started beforehand and then later on as deputy assistant director at a more of a sort of more of a policy level but I think actually my bigger impact would be at my next position when I went to work at the White House which I know you're going to ask me about so I'll, I'll save it till then. <laughs> yeah um, that was my next question um, asking about your work at the White House that's really fascinating. Um, what was it like working in the White House like as a scientist? Wow, uh, I have to say it was really different than anything I'd ever done before. Um, and I was, I rather naively thought that it would not be as political as it really was, because <laughs> it's science after all. 
Uh, but science policy is really is an altogether different beast. And it's really about um, structural, making structural changes to the system that, that oversees you know, science and science funding in our nation. So the work um, could be very frustrating because uh, we would make decisions as a team and with our partners, um, either you know, industrial, um, federal agencies, and they're being made in the, what we thought was best for science, but then they would all be reframed by the political side of the house. And the, the political side cared much more about the timing um, of announcing a policy change or the type of mechanism to be used for the policy change. So it would showcase you know, President Obama's leadership on issues. I get it, but I'm kind of a person who would just say, we've agreed upon what to do, let's just put it in place today. So that was frustrating. Yeah. So would you have meetings where you have like scientists on, on one side and politicians on the other side and kind of trying to negotiate those um, desires? <laughs> yeah, the, the scientists that we, we typically worked with um, at the, in uh, this is the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, were almost all there uh, on loan from agencies, federal agencies, or industry, uh, or they were what we call political appointees. And these were often people who had worked on the campaign and were thus rewarded with federal jobs for four to eight years, depending on the length of the administration. Uh, mostly scientists by and large, but some were very, um, again, very politically policy oriented, as opposed to myself, which was more about just building the science infrastructure in the country. So a, a different way of looking at things, it, I really learned a lot, but I also realized it was just not my cup of tea. I see, what were some of the things that you really took away from working at the, the White House? <laughs> oh gosh, I'm not sure how to answer that. So um, it's it's a crazy intense environment. Um, and even in an office like us uh, that wasn't on the ever on the front lines of the news ever. I mean, we, we got involved in a few things that came along. Um, the when the Fukushima um, disaster happened in Japan, that happened on under our watch, and we had to get involved in that, and helping with the science advisor, you know, on what was going on there. Um, and that actually, that's another example that we had to have a very broad view of the science. I mean, I had things in my portfolio like um, controlling the population of wild horses out west. I just was like, okay, this is really not something I know a lot about, but you know, I'll do the best I can. Uh, but access to um, radioactive um, nucleotides, et cetera, for medical procedures and where and where they were being made, whether they, you know, if somebody was going to shut down a reactor in Canada, then in the US, we wouldn't have access to that. So, so it was a really broad range of really interesting issues to work on. Well, it sounds really fascinating to get to have such a high level um, perspective on, on those kinds of scientific issues. Um, so after the White House, um, you went back to the NSF mm -hmm. and you started, you, you went up very high in the NSF and you started to manage some very large research budgets. And that seems really fascinating to me. What was it like to manage such large research portfolios and kind of decide where to prioritize the direction of science? So. I absolutely love that part of my job as deputy assistant director. A wise colleague once told me that budget is policy. So where you put your money speaks to what you care about. Um, and the annual budget season was always my favorite time of the year because it's it happens every year. And so within NSF uh, and with advisory committees, et cetera, we got to toss around a lot of big ideas. Uh, we got to put together teams of people to write up these ideas for the budget documents. Um, we got to make presentations to the White House Office of Management and Budget. Um, and then the budget is released. Um, as you may know, President Biden just released his budget for the year. This is a proposal that the saying is you know, the president proposes and Congress disposes. So then there'd be a long time in the Congress before they finally we would go in with their scissors and cut and paste. And at some point we would get uh, a fiscal year budget approved. And then came the next step, which was a lot of interesting decisions on how to allocate the budget that I got across um, physics, astronomy, chemistry, material science, and mathematics. And my budget for that era was $1.5 billion. So that's a really big number and a lot of responsibility. And so you wanna distribute those funds in a manner that's consistent with the long-term goals of NSF and the White House, of course, as well as um, what the individual disciplines want to accomplish.
Yeah, that sounds like a, a lot to take into account. How do you even begin to, to make those decisions and, and what was your personal impact like on those decisions? Well, those are those are decisions that aren't made uh, you know, in a vacuum. I mean, there's a lot of thought. In fact, there's a lot of multiple scenarios in budget planning that go on um, and a lot of give and take. And there was usually a core group of us, three or four of us who were in charge of that entire area of physical science and mathematics who went back and forth and a lot of decisions and decide before we finally released final numbers. So there's a, there's a lot that goes into it and, and you can't make everybody happy when you're giving out money. When you're giving out money, actually, it is a little easier when budgets are going up. When budgets are going down, it's a lot harder because then you're cutting people's previous budgets and no one's happy. I see. Um, so thinking about your overall career, um, have you ever had any doubts about where you were going with your career? And, and do you have any advice about those trying to figure out um, a rewarding career path? Hmm. Um, I was very fortunate that I, I never really had serious doubts about myself and my abilities or about my personal calling as a scientist. Um, but I did find, um, I think, some difficulties being, being a woman scientist and, and, uh, and, and a working mother. And I think we'll talk about that a little later. But I got, I got restless when I no longer felt that I was learning or feeling challenged by a position or a role that I was in. And so that's why my career sort of has these three phases that span practicing science, enabling science, and then advocating for science. Uh, I know that today people change jobs much more frequently, and that was not the case, you know, back in the 80s, 90s, et cetera. So, so for scientists, I, I, went, I moved through three different phases, and I, I actually felt very fortunate that I found each of these stages in my career growth to be just immensely rewarding. I got a lot out of it. So, you know, for people who are trying to figure out where they want to go, I think my my advice would be to um, first you got to be true to yourself and and think about your life goals, and and reevaluate those goals periodically. You know, check in with yourself to see that that you're still you're still happy and and you're still having fun. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more about some of the difficulties that you've experienced um, in science as as a woman? Absolutely. <laughs> How much time do you have? Uh, so um, I, had, uh, I had two daughters by the age of 30, um, uh, both of whom who later went to Duke, yay, uh, by the way. Um, I was one of the first female PhD scientists hired at San Diego National Labs back in 1986. Wow. So, so I experienced it, it all, uh, having to break through barriers as a woman scientist and as a full-time working mother, I mean, there was a lot going on. I had no family nearby during these, during these early years, but I had an incredibly supportive partner, my husband, um, who was a fellow chemist. And we navigate, you know, we navigated the tough times together. I could not have, I don't think I could have done it alone. Um, but that only just strengthened our relationship. And we recently celebrated 40 years of marriage, so still going. Um, but these are, these are sort of time dependent problems um, that wax and wane over your life. There'll be different phases, um, as a, especially as a, as a woman scientist or as a mother, um, and you'll, you'll have different issues um, and they will evolve as your children evolve or as, as your success evolves. So, you know, in the, in the near term, you know, have a plan, you know, how to handle problems in the near term um, and let that help guide you to prioritize what you have to do, and then, um, you know, just tackle them, divide and conquer. Yeah, so in terms of, of being a mother and, and navigating that, how have you kind of like balanced like such a, a challenging career and workload with, with living a life just as a, as a human being? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not easy, and, and, and anyone who tells you that it is, is, is extremely fortunate. So um, I don't think there is any one-size-fits-all solution. I think, I think I'll talk a little later about, you know, some policy things that we've put in place, um, between National Science Foundation and even the, the White House efforts to just to make things easier for, for women scientists, and, and especially those who, who become parents. It's, uh, I, I, 
I just would not speak to anyone particularly about, you know, what they should or shouldn't be doing. I think it's a really personal decision about what you want to prioritize in your life at, at what, what point in time. Um, yeah, so maybe talking about some of those projects, um, what have been your favorite projects that you've led, led or some pivotal moments in your career? Yeah, so I know you're going to ask this question. So I was thinking in terms of what what would be something of maximum impact and I, there are a lot of things in my different stages you know i could talk about something in, in science that i enjoy etc but but what i really want to talk about is something that is it seems so trivial right now but it was a federal policy change that i shepherded through during my time at the white house and that was to ensure that professors who uh, had federal research grants could get reimbursed um, with federal dollars on, from those grants for the cost of dependent care when they travel to scientific meetings. Doesn't that sound obvious? Yes, but no. <laughs> um, conference grants as well would use federal dollars, uh, allowing them to provide local or on-site dependent care for attendees at research conferences. Um, again, sounds really simple and obvious. Uh, it took many, many years to get that, those sorts of costs to be considered allowable under federal grants. But, and that, that we accomplished that probably about 10 to 12 years ago. So well, uh, I think it was actually, that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> so that's how long it took. So long after whenever I could take advantage of it. So, um, you know, the other impact that you have besides looking at, you know, a policy change, structural changes, uh, you know, a scientific accomplishment. The other really, really rewarding thing over the arc of your, your career is, is mentoring people. And so mentoring my staff so that they could develop into leaders and choose their career paths and do it on their own terms is probably actually at the end of the day, the most rewarding thing. Yeah, that makes sense. That one-on-one -on -one impact that you get to have. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any advice that you want students to know about your field? You've worked in many fields. So. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I, I'm not up to date about the current state of research and chemistry, so I, I really don't have any advice in that respect. But, um, you know, in general, I would say if you're if you're in science, I would I want you to be really open to research opportunities that that connect you to and and let you collaborate with people from other scientific disciplines. I think that was that was really key in, in my development. I did that a lot earlier than a lot of other people did. And I, I think that really helped prepare me for uh, later stages in my career. And I think one other thing I like, I like to plug, something I, I learned at, at NSF and it's been really valuable is to expand that same openness to, to new ideas, to um, fields really far away from you, I was going to say behavioral and social sciences, um, because I've discovered working with scientists in that area there, they have, they're just rich with scholarly results. Um, and they can, and those results can really influence how you how you practice in your professional life and and really help you with your leadership abilities. Um, are you seeing any new trends um, in your field or certain skills? you think would be really helpful for developing at the moment? Yeah, so so I don't really have a field anymore, but I, I would say one of the things that I emphasize now when 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 talking to, you know, college students and graduate students is, is really the importance of honing um, your professional development skills. It was really important to me uh, and uh, for my staff. And professional development skills typically aren't taught in formal education settings except perhaps in business schools. And so some examples of these would be um, negotiation, the art of negotiation, um, the importance of mentoring and being mentored and how to find a mentor, um, persuasive writing, um, something that a scientist needs right away is effective presentation techniques. So what I really recommend is that people as early in their career as possible, take advantage of any kind of training, especially free training in these areas that would be offered by your employer or your university. Um, and I think that I've always found that no matter what training course I took, even if I liked it or didn't like it or thought it was valuable or not, I'd always try to take home um, at least one thing, one thing I learned from that and try to apply it or incorporate it into my professional life. Yeah, and, and as one of my last questions that I have prepared, um, do you have any resources that you want um, students to know about 
um, to get more engaged with science policy or science research? So good question. I obviously I don't have anything that's that's that would be discipline specific, um, but I would recommend to students that they become active um, or be, get involved in activities that expand their network. I, I cannot stress the importance of networking. Again, looking back to the perspective of a longer career. So if you belong to um, some sort of you know topical club that interests you. Uh, absolutely join your professional societies. There'll be, there'll be an advantage to that later on, even if you don't see it right now. Um, obviously attending conferences and meetings where you can, sitting in on um, guest lectures, things like that. Uh, the other thing that I'd, I'd recommend that people have uh, and take some time to think about it and practice it is I would call it an elevator pitch about yourself. I think you all know what an elevator pitch is, but you only have a very short time to sort of talk about yourself in front of a very important person that you might just get a chance to talk to, right? So I think it's really good to have something succinct uh, and ready to say, you never know um, who you're gonna meet. And I think it's really important to have something like that, you know, ready in the back, so. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, those are all the, the formal questions that I have prepared. I can definitely ask more questions um, about your career as well, um, but I don't know if it makes sense to open it up to other questions as well. Well, let's see if Christina's got some questions in the chat or anywhere else first before we go, go on. Yeah, yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much. And yeah, at this time we can uh, welcome any other questions from our audience. And feel free to um, unmute yourself if you, if you wanna ask it um, yourself or you can throw it in the chat and I'm happy to, to read it out, uh, either one. Don't be shy. <laughs> Um, I can go first. Thank you so much for, for your time and for being here. Um, I was wondering if in some of your NSF positions and at the White House position, were the individuals that you worked with um, also career scientists who made the switch or were they individuals maybe with a PhD who decided they wanted to do this earlier um, and then continued with it? Yeah, great question. And if you're you're thinking about the track that say say you have a PhD or you're getting your PhD and you're trying to decide, do I really want to do research or maybe I've I've done this long enough and I want to do something else. And, and they often want to try science policy uh, as the next step. So um, when people ask me that question, I do encourage people to go ahead forward with the postdoc position because when you do a postdoc, uh, you're in a different lab, you're in a different place with a different advisor, and it could be a, quite a different experience than what you ex had in graduate school. So I think it's, I don't think you wanna give up uh, doing research too early. Uh, the longer you do it, the better positioned you are if you wanna pursue like science policy. Um, that said, yes, there are, uh, you know, at a place like NSF, usually people are mid-career scientists when they when they join and they already have established um, their scientific reputation, uh, either you know either through you know industry patents or publications as an academic or as a national lab researcher. So uh, and some make uh, some come and try it for a while and then they go back um, and some stay on. Like I decided to do at NSF uh, at the White House, everyone's temporary. Um, you know, in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, I think there's one or two permanent people, basically, you know, there's administrative staff, there's, a, there's an attorney, and there's a few that are, that are permanent, but um, that changes all the time. And during, even during an administration, people are just moving in and out, but there's a wholesale change when the administration changes. So um, does that help you? Uh, did I answer your question or is there more? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Julia. Lexi, do you have a question for us? Yeah, so thank you again um, for giving all your insights about your experience. I was, um, so I'm a grad student at Duke, so I was more curious about learning um, between your postdoc experience and being at a national lab and then the transition more into a policy side. Um, what do you think like the key experiences or programs or opportunities that you took advantage of um, helped prepare you to make that transition? That's a, that's a really good question. I'll have to think hard if I can answer that <laughs> succinctly. Um, I did a postdoc at a national lab uh, because I had made up my mind during my uh, 
graduate school days, I was not interested in being a professor, but I didn't know quite what I wanted to do. I was thinking, well, do I want to do industry? Do I want to do National Lab? National Lab was a chance to uh, also get access to some really specialized equipment that I couldn't get elsewhere. And I thought it'd be fun, just a fun thing to go do. I mean, it's only a two year, three year commitment, why not? So, uh, but then I really enjoyed the National Lab uh, environment. And then I decided to stay in it. And then I got a job at, at a different national lab and spent a long time there. And again, that was just pursuing science. But um, I, as I mentioned, I got a little restless. I wanted to try something new. And so going to National Science Foundation was uh, really low risk because it's a you know it's a you know, one to two year position uh, and you're loaned out to go there. So you can always go back to your home. Uh, institution, whether it was industry or a national lab or a university. Uh, so it seemed like a low risk way to try to do something really different without making a, you know, I met, had to make a leap by moving from California to Washington, DC, but um, I had the permanence of my job behind me if I wanted to go back to, to doing research. Uh, and while at NSF, I just found the environment so in incredibly stimulating. And also um, for me personally, there were a, a large number of women scientists there. It was, it was really refreshing. Um, my first division director was a woman scientist and I, I was, I was, it was great to have those sorts of role models around. So that made a lot of difference um, to me. Um, you know, you grow at every stage in your career. You thought, I was think, still thinking about chemistry, but then I started to think more about making all these connections with material science and, and physics and um, biology, of course, especially in biochemistry, doing a lot of collaborative work and putting together um, research programs, funding opportunities in these areas. Uh, and then I think the next stage was that as a federal employee, one cannot um, advocate for one's agency. It's, it's not permitted, it's verboten. So uh, I kept thinking about, there's only so much I can do in this role. And I, I think I want a role that's even bigger where I can really make sure people understand the importance of science and funding science. And so I got that opportunity at the White House. Um, the way the White House being as political as it was, was not to my taste. But later I made the switch over to American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is its entire role is really about advocacy for science. And that was something that, again, sort of the final stage of my career, I was, I was really passionate about. Does that help answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Julia? Um, I don't want to hog the conversation, but if no one else. Um, so when you were at the NSF again, managing um, that very large research budget, did you learn those project management skills on the job or did you do any specific training to help with that? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, I would say that um, in my, my final position there, I had a we had staff close to 200 in that area, um, and so I oversaw quite a few senior senior executives who then uh, were each of those disciplinary areas. Um, again, along the way, you want to take as much training as possible. So project management has sort of a specific definition, just, just so you know, uh, when you say that, it often means for people, um, and I'll take the example of astronomy, there's a lot of project management around building a telescope, um, you know, in Chile or in Hawaii, and there's a lot of steps. And so there's a skill, a very specific skill called program um, project management. Um, but it, and so taking that aside, yes, you do need a lot of training to learn how to do that well. Um, but we would do something called program management, which was um, more or less how to put the pieces together to have a diverse portfolio of funding funded projects. Uh, that met sort of all sorts of criteria that we were trying to do, making sure that we had a balance with um, research done with, a, with a, a large research institution such as like Duke, but also allowing opportunities for small colleges to re get research funding. We care a lot about funding people early in their career, about, as well as senior scientists who are further along. Um, we cared about the diversity, um, you know, and gender and ethnicity, race, et cetera, of our, of our investigators. We care a lot about what areas of science we were funding. Did we have the right balance? Did we have too many people in this, you know, in organic chemistry and not enough in physical chemistry? You know, so that's an art. And that's something that I would say was learned on the job. So um, did that answer your question? I hope. Oh, 
All right. Anyone else? Question? And I see Anna put, a, put one in the chat. Do you want to um, ask your question next? Yeah, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the time you spent advocating for science and, and what were some of the projects that you worked on? Uh, that was that was really fun. That was really fun at the end of my career to do this. Um, let's see. Uh, so at, at, at AAAS, well, we put together, so so we lived in interesting times just when uh, the Obama administration ended and the Trump administration began. And there was a lot of concern in the scientific community what was going to happen to, to science and science funding under, under former President Trump. So um, there was the March on Science. Uh, which was held in Washington, D.C., which was, you know, started by a grassroots group, but AAAS, American Association for Advancement of Science, sorry, I'll speak in acronyms, uh, really took the, the lead role of signing up for that and, and we're doing a lot of organizational work on that uh, activity to, to um, bring that to uh, everyone, the nation's attention, as well as the uh, attention of people in Washington, D.C. Uh, we did work on... Um, uh, gender and equity issues with respect to publishing. Uh, as you may know, AAAS publishes the journal Science, which is one of the most, I believe, the most prestigious journal uh, that you can publish in. And uh, we paid a lot of attention to uh, the distribution of um, authors uh, who were women or minorities. And we did a really great session with other uh, publishing societies, other uh, institutes, other um, professional societies that published, et cetera. We, did, we had quite a, a large symposium on that to talk about the issues there, to talk about how to get fair reviews uh, in, peer, in peer review. Does that answer? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Is there more in the chat? <laughs> Not any that I see right now. Okay. Um, but I can also ask one. So in terms of thinking through your, your career, do you have a big regret at any moment? Um, or, and maybe what was your, your best surprise? So yes, regrets. I've had a few. It sounds, <laughs> sounds like a line. It is a line from a song. Um, I would say that it was, it was very difficult making the transition from Sandia to NSF. On the one hand, I really wanted to try something new and I knew I, it was not a permanent one-way transition. I could go back, but it was really, really hard when I finally decided to stay at NSF uh, to think about giving up doing science, practicing science. I mean, I've trained my whole life to do it. That's what I had been doing and I really, really loved it. And it was a so it was really hard to give that up. I guess I can't quite call it a regret because I got to do so many more interesting things in my career because I, I took the risk and made that change. So um, there was a second part to the question. <laughs> was it something surprisingly fun or happy? Yes. Yeah. Your best. Your best surprise. You know, what surprised you the most in your career that just turned into being a, a happy surprise? A happy surprise. I'm having. <laughs> I mean. There were so many happy things. I'm, 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 I'm trying to uh, find one that I can speak to. Um, well, okay, I, you know, a happy surprise is that it going into it, and I'll, I'll speak as a, as a, as a working mother who was a scientist. I think the happy surprise was I had no idea how this was going to work out, and no, no one does when they have children and then they want to pursue their career. And it's, you know, there's travel and it's, there's, you know, it's not a nine to five job. There's a lot of work and there's a lot of work balance issues, et cetera. Um, but I say the happy surprise, the really rewarding surprise at the end is it, it worked out really, really well. <laughs> so, you know, I, I actually, at times I thought, oh gosh, you know, <laughs> my kids are going, they're, they're going to hate me or whatever or something. I'm not, I'm not a mother who stays home and, you know, bakes cookies for them or something, right? And, you know, uh, so figuring out how to do that and, and make it work, uh, you just figured out along the way. But I would say the really happy surprise there was that I think it, it worked out really well. I'm very proud of my kids. I'm One's a lawyer, one's a doctor, and um, they both went to Duke and they both love me very much. So that was, a it's wonderful, so. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another question. Um, so you mentioned in the past that you advocate for for more science to be considered in the 
the development of policy. Yeah. And I was wondering if you see more or less openness um, to the influence of science and policy in the United States government. I'm sure it like depends on, on the, the regime at the moment, but I guess I'm wondering if you think that there will be more, a growing um, science policy uh, position in the future. I think science policy as a, as, a, as a field of itself has really come into its own. And so there's, uh, so yes, so I think there's a lot more respect for it. There are a lot more people who are engaging in it and making careers out of it. There's, there's science policy, which is uh, things, you know, things that affect science, policy that affects science. And there's also science for policy, which is a little different and something else for people to, to, to think about. There's a lot of science, um, there's a lot of mathematics that underlie a lot of policy decisions outside of things that you would think would be typically science. So there's, a, there's another role there as well. Just something to throw out there for people who are thinking about going into science policy. There's really two pieces there and you have to think about which one. So yes, I think obviously it depends a lot on the administration, um, we, we, you know, but I am really excited uh, where the current president is with this. Um, the, the, you know, the chief of staff uh, for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy worked for me at AAAS. I consider him one of my mentees. There are other people there who work there that I know. Um, they're a really good group of people. And so I'm very optimistic that science will be informing policy all around the government, as well as there'll be really good science policy done within OSTP. That's great to hear. <laughs> yeah. Hi, hello. I'm Mr. Oko, and I work in Geocazo in the clinical research department. I came across your profile through the social media, so that's why I decided to join you. So I'm sorry for coming late. I just finished from work. So my question that I brought in today was, um, how can one channel um, to be specific in choosing a PhD career so that um, you know, to just choose a PhD career because I feel having the specialty in that PhD career can be confusing because, for example, I want to do my PhD in immunology or pathology, but I have to narrow it down. And I'm saying that it's gonna be a little bit tricky or difficult. So how am I going to know which one I'm going towards? So if I can, if I, if I can, let me see, I understood you correctly. So you're interested in sort of how, how to make a choice between what sort of area to specialize yes. in for your PhD. Yes. Yeah. And it's, a, and it's actually a choice between, you know, two different departments. It's not a subspecialty within a department, right? So that's what you're asking. And, you know, I think that you, uh, if you're an undergraduate now, you should be doing research. So you should be um, pursuing research at the undergraduate level in the in the areas that you think interest you. Um, you should be doing lots of interesting reading about areas that really excite yeah. you. And yeah. uh, it's a lot about it uh, is also choosing the right um, PhD advisor. So mm -hmm. if you are looking at a couple of possible institutions, one of the things you might be looking at is a, is a large enough research institution where you could change, you could change fields. I mean, you could go in immunology and then decide that maybe you're better off in a biochemistry or something, and that it's a large enough institution that you could make that, that change, kind of like changing your major as an undergrad. So that's something to think about if you're not 100% sure. Also, you know, if you wanna reach out and talk to people who could be potential PhD mm -hmm. advisors to you and see who you have a really strong connection with. Okay. Okay, hope that helps. Yes. So do you think um, the source for PhD candidates is in demand in the job market? So the question is about job prospects for PhDs? Yes. Right. So I, obviously that really depends on the area of, of science that you're in. And I, I can't speak to, to all of it. But, you know, while you're in graduate school, um, you want to talk to people like Christina here, who's hosting this, <laughs> and she can help, you know, a career, a career advisory center is not just for undergraduates at an institution, graduate students are, I think, notorious for not 
not uh, working enough with the, uh, the options and the offerings at a career advising center. So that's one area. And then as you become, once you go into graduate school and you're working through, you'll hear a lot about all of your colleagues and where they're getting jobs and where they're working. So you'll get, you'll get a good handle on what, the, what their career possibilities are. Thanks so much. Sure. Thanks. And yes, happy to talk more if you if you want to make an appointment. Um, so that is an option to everybody as well. If you want to speak with a career advisor, um, you can make an appointment on Handshake and talk about some of these some of these goals that you're you're and decisions you're you're weighing between. But happy mm -hmm. to continue the conversation. Anyone else have a question? All right, maybe one more, one more question and then we'll wrap up. I'm happy to ask me anything, as they say. I'm happy to answer anything I can. I guess one thing I would wonder is about a time where you were kind of like, like struggling to keep up with things and um, how did you manage to end up like, like finding a balance with everything? I know we kind of touched on it, but um, I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, happens all the time. I mean, I'm sure it happens to you as an undergrad, you know, you've got coursework and you've got, you know, you've got research activities going on. Um, you want to go to the basketball game, you know, <laughs> you want to go to this party, you know, you just have to make these decisions and choices. Uh, the rest of your life is going to be like that. I, I wish I could say it's, it's eventually going to calm down, but not until you're retired, which is where I am now. <laughs> you know, do I not have a full calendar of things that I can't possibly fit in the day? So, um, yeah, I, I don't really have any, again, really strong advice other than, you know, my approach was, you know, just again, to kind of prioritize there's, there are things that are important and there are things that are urgent and sometimes the two don't overlap and you have to make some decisions there. Also, I think just being flexible, realizing that, you know, the day you've planned ahead for yourself or the week you've planned ahead for yourself or the month or the year, it's, it's, it's probably not going to happen. I mean, it's a good idea to have a plan so you know what you're shooting for, but, you know, don't be disappointed if you just don't, you know, check all those boxes at the end of the day or the end of the year. I practice yoga, that helps too, you know, <laughs> time off to meditate and, and be quiet and try to calm the mind so you can sleep, That's that helps too. And we do have one more question in the chat as well. So were there any mistakes or pitfalls you saw earlier career individuals make somewhat regularly and best ways to avoid them? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I would say something that I saw uh, happen um, that would be burning, burning bridges. <laughs> so uh, I think there was, there a tendency in younger people just to sort of plow ahead and do what they kind of want to do. And it's, it's part of the way the educational system works. You, you, you are educated, especially at the PhD level in a very, very narrow area. And the first thing you really have to learn when you get out of that is to now start broadening yourself to be successful. So um, I would say, you know, burning bridges in terms of, um, having research collaborations that, that failed or taking them personally, things like that, uh, they don't work in, in your favor. I mean, you wanna try to, you always wanna think about always expanding, you know, where you're going and who you work with and everything and not being as judgmental of other people that even could possibly be your competitors. Great, thank you. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, we can go ahead and conclude our conversation today. But I just want to do a big round of applause for uh, for Dr. Rolfing. We appreciate your 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 perspective and your story about your career. Um, and yes, and and let me know. I can if if you're willing to share your contact information with with any of the students, we can connect after this to. And if anyone wants to follow up with you and, and continue the conversation from there as well. I, I would be happy to. You have my email. Just go ahead and distribute anyone who wants it. I'd be happy to set up time um, to talk to somebody 
on campus somewhere over a cup of coffee or my case tea. Uh, outdoors still, I'm not, <laughs> so I wanna wear, I'm still wearing a mask inside, but uh, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And I appreciate it and um, know too that this session has also been recorded. So if you, um, if anyone attending wants to watch it later and um, look at it again, uh, it'll be up on our, our career hub. But thank you all for attending. Thank you very much for inviting me.